Norberto Amaral, the Communication, Creativity and Innovation Management Consultant, also an event organizer and host of TEDx Porto, one of the largest TEDx events in the world. He has extensive experience in training for public speaking, presentations, and of course, event organization. And not only that, but he has organized and he has been a speaker and moderator in over 100 events of TEDx, Ignite, speech competitions, creative sessions, strategic workshops, among others. I invited Norberto Amaral to be one of the coaches for our speakers in the next Stand Up and Speak Up Challenge. And I'm so thrilled that he said yes. And I'm so even more thrilled that some of the speakers had the opportunity to work with him on their speeches. Norberto is also about to launch his first book, Impact. It's only in Portuguese and it's called Impacto. And this book is about how to craft presentations which will be effective and create the impact you want. And today I have the pleasure to spend some time in this conversational interview with Norberto. It's such a pleasure to have you here with me Thank and you for too. my community. Uh, Norberto is, uh, became a friend we met through Toastmasters and Toastmasters is a big family for us, all of us. And if Toastmasters is also the foundation for us to be doing what we do right now and uh, me and my mission to help women to have a voice out there. And Norberto, besides everything he does, he also is the, um, in charge of one of the most important TEDx in the world. I can say like that, no, Norberto, because you have... TEDx Porto has more than 1,500 people uh, every time. Yep. Isn't it true? Yes, absolutely. Since uh, 2010. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, uh, it requires a lot of skills on not only organization, but also how to select the right people to be on stage. And this is why I invited Norberto here to share with us his wisdom and his secrets on how we can become more effective uh, speakers and presented and share our message out there. Norberto, welcome. Thank you so much, Tulio. Thank you for inviting me. You're more than welcome. So my first question to you here, what is for you, the, uh, what's the importance of developing a good speaking skills for you on your own experience? Well, in my own experience, this has been extremely important at every level. Until a few years ago, I was a project manager. And as a project manager, we need to talk to everyone. We need to talk to stakeholders in the project, for, for example, the steering committees and the, the, anyone who is literally that we report to. We also have to talk to our peers. We have to engage with, with um, people that we had to convince about the benefits of a certain project. And in order to do so, you have to be convincing. You have to have everything well prepared, but you also have to make a connection with the public. That could be in very small meetings most of the time, uh, anything from two people to 20 people. So it, it's not really like on, on a stage, although it can happen. But that is actually paramount because if we are able to communicate that in a natural way, in a way that we are mostly interested in the interests of the pe people that we're talking to, that, that means that we make that connection and people will, will understand that we're not doing this for, you know, for, for um, envies, you know, for, for um, a, the bad reason. So we always have into consideration that interest. But more than that, a few years ago, I left my company where I was working for 15 years and I've been devoting myself to my own company. So I now have a consultancy where I do this. So, I mean, it's not trying to come up with the, with the publicity, but the fact that a few years ago myself, I wasn't able to speak in public. I, that's something that I learned. It's not something that I was born with. Like many people think that it's like a, a talent that we're born with or we're not. So maybe I was, but I didn't know. It was awakened lately. And now I actually am a trainer, a public speaking trainer. And this has been able, well, I've been able to do this via my training in Toastmasters and also for the fact that I'm organizing TEDx Porto, as you said. 
So I'm able to help the speakers to make, be a better version of themselves on, on, on the stage. So this is, it's so important to me that it's actually, this is my life right now. This is the center of, of my professional life. Mm. I can fully relate to you because I have a similar journey. And I believe when uh, sharing my own experience here with you, uh, when you understand how you communicate and how you can communicate uh, more effectively, how, what you, ca uh, you can do to communicate more effectively, this uh, builds up your confidence as well. And you start res uh, having better results in whatever you do because it, that brings clarity. Do you mm -hmm. agree with me? Absolutely. That's, I think that the most important thing that we have to be concerned about is the message itself and not any other things that you know, are secondary. They're so, also very important, but they are secondary. So we do need to, fit, to put our eyes on, on the message to make sure that it's clear, as clear as possible. For example, there's an old saying that says that basically we, if we want to get our message across, even if we talk to very intelligent people who have uh, PhDs and everything, we have to make our message so clear that even if a, a 10 year old would be able to understand. So even the vocabulary needs to be simple because every time you make your message more difficult to be understood, unless you're in a real academic context, which is, I guess, a little bit different. If you make your message difficult, then people may actually still understand it, but it will be difficult. It's like reading a text in, a, in a two different fonts. There are fonts which make it easier and people don't even realize that it's easier, but they will read um, in a, in a, you know, they're read quickly, quicker, uh, quicker, but they will also be able to understand it more, more easily as compared to other fonts where none of that happens. So speaking in public is the same. You have to chip away all the potential barriers between yourself as a speaker and the public to make sure that the information and the message flows. And there are many ways of doing that, obviously, but the most important, here is, the most important thing here is don't make it difficult. Make it really easy to be understood. Instead of creating, you know, like putting yourself on a pedestal with very difficult jargon, very difficult vocabulary. No, do it exactly the opposite. You just make it sure that everybody understands you. I mean, if, especially, for example, if you want to be a politician, you definitely have to, be, to use very simple language, whoever you're talking to. Because if you don't do, that, don't do that, then people won't follow you. If you don't do that, people will not buy on your ideas. But if you do it, you know, the potential is, is endless. Yeah, and you said everything because communication is about connection. Mm -hmm. And we are there to connect. We have a message. And in a way, like at the moment I'm there delivering something, I'm talking to you and you mentioned about the stage and this is something I, I say to my students as well. A stage, it, it, this is here a stage as well. The conversation mm -hmm. 101 and to a thousand people are a stage. As you are here uh, sharing an idea or even trying to persuade someone in your, uh, 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 to buy, in a sense, to, to follow what you have to say. So it's all about connection and you, you have to be, build this bridge between me and you here. We have to build this bridge where you make sure that I understand what you're talking about and uh, you understand what I talk about. And you mentioned about politicians. I just want to uh, make a parenthesis here that I read, I don't know where now, that uh, Churchill, who is considered one of the best orators now okay. uh, in history, he used to, um, in his speeches and the, the papers, documents they, they have uh, from his notes, he always used short sentences and very simple words. Exactly. And the many of the, the, his um, papers, like uh, his drafts, he, there was a lot of corrections of like he's substituting some more sophisticated word mm -hmm. to a, a simpler word. So this is something that we have to have in mind. It's not about it coming with all this elaborate mm -hmm. uh, language and vocabulary. Is in fact finding a language that easy to understand that people grabs immediately because then you keep the connection. Yes. Yeah. It, that happens at every level. It can be with politicians, with scientists and so on. Just imagine yourself, instead of being on stage, you are in the public and you're listening to someone who you really admire. And this person is able to put really difficult concepts like, I don't know, physics, why not, in front of you. With, and you understand. 
And you know what happens? You feel intelligent. You feel really bright, right? Yeah. So you feel that you have a value for that person, although that person wasn't talking to you personally. They were talking to, I don't know, tens or hundreds of people. But you felt, wow, I felt really bright listening. And I was finally able to understand, I don't know, quantum mechanics or relativity or whatever. And when you have that insight, you feel like, yes, I can understand this. I will be able, I will ha actually have, I'm more curious to learn even more about this. And I feel like I, I can do something. I, you know, when you feel smart, if you can do anything, right? But you know, imagine the opposite. When a speaker doesn't do this, we feel completely on the side. You feel that, oh, I'm not smart enough to do this. So you feel like you, you, you may understand a few things, but you think, mm, this is not my thing. I, 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 you know, you're actually afraid of approaching the speaker at, at lunchtime or at one of the coffee breaks. So, and that's the result of barriers. So if you make it simpler, it's easier. I'll, just a, a quick example. We had a physicist from CERN, uh, Stephen Goldfarb. He was a speaker at TEDx Porzo, um three years ago. And he was talking about the universe and the dark matter, dark energy. And, you know, he could have put equations there. But, of course, nobody would understand a single thing. A single, not a single person from the audience would be able to understand an equation. But, look, equations would be obviously the most important thing, way of, you know, the, not the clearest, but the most important way of putting your message across. But if we did, he did that, we would all be like looking, you know, like, um, you know, completely dumbfounded. We wouldn't be able to understand anything. So he replaced whatever equations he had with a metaphor. He said, the universe is like a pint of beer, a dark beer. So whatever is dark, you don't see it. That's dark matter and that's dark energy. You only see that little sliver at the top, that piece of foam. That's what you see. That's what you can interact with. And, you know, that's not really a, a lot of information. But it is information that we can use. It's information that we can relate to. And it's information that we can understand. And I'll tell you what, from that slide that he had with a pint of beer there, a huge slide, many people, and including people that you and I know, Leah, were pick, taking pictures and putting online. And that's, you know, that helps spread the message across. Rather than, again, you could have put a huge equation there and people would be like, oh, yeah, right, as if I understand anything, any of that. So. And that's our obligations as speakers. We, we yeah. can't escape that. We, we shouldn't create barriers between us and the public. And this is for me, rule number one. Number yes. one, know your audience. Yes, absolutely. Know your audience. It's like you have to know everything about your audience. Absolutely. And what do as they much expect? as you can. Yeah, huh? Who are they? What do they expect? What, what do they want to do after you finish this? Why is this much as important, important for these people? And if you make them, even if it's not important, but if you make them feel it is important, then it will become important. And then they will, they will not be looking at their mobile phones while they're listening to you. They won't be on Facebook or LinkedIn, distracted or playing a game. They'll be looking at you. They'll be following you. And that's what you want. You know, it can't be, I can't find a more disputing thing as a speaker than to looking at you and and everybody is not looking at you. You know, that is, when that happens, you're not making a connection, right? No connections. As I say, no connections, no business. Exactly. No connections, no trust. No trust, no business. Absolutely. That's it. But, In but our days, yeah. we have this opportunity to use our stage to uh, bring visibility to ourselves, mm -hmm. to our brand, raise our profile, raise our credibility and authority. And if, but we, if we don't bond with the audience, if we don't communicate with their language, mm -hmm. we are just there showing off and nobody likes People who and, show and you know, the, the most interesting <laughs> thing I, I find about this is that we live in an increasingly technological, technological era. We depend on cars, on airplanes, on mobile phones and computers and everything. Of course, we're using a computer to record this. But the connection is physical. It's, it's between two people. It could be via a communications device, of course. But many times it's actually in person. You, you don't need, need new technologies for this. You don't need PowerPoint. You don't need mobile phones and fancy things. No. You just need to have a body, you know, looking at someone and a voice. And that's it. There's no technology involved there or hardly any. So when you do this, you're able to, I mean, it's actually funny, first of all, because you, if we live in a, such a technological era, but, you know, for the most important things that we need, even actually, ironically, to build up more technology, we don't use technology. We go back to the basics. We go back to you and I, like a, a grandfather, a parent and a, a grandson, by the fireplace, you know, telling stories. So that's what really matters. And you can do this without, uh, with, first of all, you don't have to buy anything. It's just yourself and being able to speak. So if you can do that, that's, that's fine. And then you build up that, this relationship 
which may take just a few minutes, but you have to build that relationship even during that period. And you know what, for example, if you are in an event where you have, I don't know, maybe five, 10, 15 people speaking, and if you are able to do that connection, people will remind you, sorry, will remember you when it's finished. If you don't, what's most likely to think, the, most, the, the thing that's most likely to happen is that when you finish, you go off to the coffee break or at lunchtime and nobody will approach you. It's like Absolutely. people forgot you. Is this just like the example you gave with the pint? Even I haven't been in this presentation, but every time now that I think about the universe, I'm going to think pint, about yeah. that a pint of, of Guinness. With exactly. The, yeah. So these are the metaphors. This is the beauty of communication. And unfortunately, some people, uh, I've seen this complaint, uh, maybe you, you have already, and um, you have uh, as well, mm -hmm. Uh, the people, uh, they are trying to communicate to p pass through a message and then they don't reach the results they, they want. And they kind of say, oh, you yeah, know, I've been, I did my best. Uh, or even in their mind, they think they did their best. And the problem is Noberto is not prepared to understand me. And then I, <laughs> what I say to my, my students and my mentees, like it's tough on you because if you're communicating, if you want to pass a message through and the other side is not understanding you, it's not their problem. It's yes. your problem. So you have to work on your message. So this is very important because I believe you experience the same as I do, Norberto, even more with the TEDx that you have probably have an avalanche of, uh, of uh, applications for people to present in your event where uh, people, uh, they forget about this first big rule know your audience, your message has to reach them, it's about them, it's not about you, exactly. you're not that important. So on that note, what would be, what do you look for? I gave mm -hmm. a big hint already to the, to the <laughs> audience. What do you look for when you uh, run for, for uh, the applications, you open for the applications for the ZX? In well, we'll try I know these. you have a, a, a theme every year, but there are some criteria, so there's a lot of Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we, we have a theme, as you said. So every year we have a theme, but the theme is sufficiently wide and ambiguous. It's open on purpose so that we can uh, approach and we can include many different types of messages. So most of the times, most of the times the theme is not, it doesn't close, doesn't really limit our options, quite the opposite. Of course, it's not completely open, but you know, at least it's more open than, than not. Now, once we have the theme and we have all the sub-themes also, like we do a brainstorm and, and then we have, I don't know, maybe 100, 200 sub-themes that we would like to see on stage. And we do a prioritization, we start looking for speakers. And we do receive lots of speakers, like lots of uh, messages from speakers or people who want to speak at that portal. And when it comes to that, we have a three, three or four things that we, we look for. Okay, the first one really is, is this uh, an idea or a project or something that can be uh, that we, 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 the, the, that person, that, that speaker can share in, with the public? And is it original? Or is it something that's really old, like five or ten years old? That's already old. So we, we don't want people to come to a stage and see old things. We want to see novel things. Because it's not a question of, of just um, ignoring what's old. It's a question of making sure that we, we always have a, a road ahead of us. That we, 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 yes, we looked behind us, but that during that day, during that event, we're looking for the future. We're looking, we, we have this, I wouldn't say really just optimism, but this realism that we think that there are solutions to our problems and solutions come, will, be, will be implemented in the future. So when we have this, we also look for what are the reasons why we'd like to have, you know, why this speaker is, is going to be on stage. Because sometimes it's self-promotion. And we don't look, that, we look for self-promotion whatsoever. So we, if we look for someone who's just doing that, uh, you know, wants to be a speaker just because he wants to have a, a video on, on TEDx channel or something, that's not a good reason, obviously. So we look for authenticity. We look for someone who's genuine. And for someone who's generous and wi willing and able to share a message with the public. Now, the message itself, uh, let's say the idea, the project, going back to it, it has to have a few characteristics, uh, characteristics as well. Apart from being novel, it needs to be something that ideally replicated. So it needs to be something real. It can't just be an opinion and that's it. So I, you can just go, can't just go to a, a stage and say, oh, I think social media is bad. And that's it. No, it's not, it doesn't work like that. So, okay, it's bad, but why is it bad? Why, how, how, how bad is it? So what can we do to improve it? 
how can I personally do what, I'm sorry, what can I personally do to solve this? Or how can I engage with my public or with my, my network to ensure that people change their behavior somehow? So if we have an idea that is, we know what the idea is perfectly clearly, that we know how important it is. And third, we have an idea through the speaker about what would be the next steps. So that's what we call the three Ws, by the way. So the what, the so what, and what now. So if you have those three things, that's, you're already on a good path to have someone on stage, definitely. What, so what, and what now? I yes. really like that one. And back on what you said, a very important point there is I sometimes receive, um, I'm approached by uh, people or uh, ladies who want to speak mm -hmm. in my events, but I, I'm, I sometimes I'm an amazed where they come forward, they say, I want to be uh, on your stage, but they come without any proposition. Uh, what they will bring to my event, not to me, but to my event of being on stage, or even like they would say, okay, I can promote your, your event if you allow me to be on your stage, yes. the, which can be a good compromise. But what exactly uh, uh, are you going to, uh, is the added value that you're going to bring to my event or to the, to the, the audience out there? So this is a call to, to action, or, uh, a call of awareness Yes. to speakers and professionals out there because you from as you stated very well from your uh, from the background as state uh, at ted dex organizers in your team you're looking for specific things but you have already a very uh, established criteria as you yeah. explained here however uh, for experts and professionals out there when they approach a promoter or organizer have a conversation with this organizer and ask this organizer, what exactly are you looking for? So then you can shape your skills and make a proposal. Just don't come and say, I want to be on your stage. Uh, I promote your event if you want me to be on your stage. And if you don't even know what's the, the core, what's the, what I'm, I'm looking for to, mm -hmm. to my objective with this day of the uh, with the event in the first place and uh, this is this is very very uh, sad because immediately goes against that professional because I feel mm -hmm. like this person is in comes to what you said uh, self, uh, you said about self promotion yes. and you can see that it's not really like a win win situation and the person is only will, uh, looking after their own benefit in promoting themselves. So yeah, I, I think to you that you, there are many conferences and many events where the promoters themselves don't really have uh, um, a clear idea about what specifically they want. So uh, even before talking about the speakers, there are, I mean, uh, to be honest, I think most of the TEDx events do that, but most of the non-TEDx events don't do that. So for non-TEDx events, most times, I'm not saying it's everyone, but almost everyone that I see, they're worried about filling a gap in the schedule. And if it's an important person, fantastic. If it's someone like a CIO or CEO of a big company, amazing. And that's enough. And oh, sorry, sir, what will we be talking about? Oh, I'll be talking about the cloud and investment. Fine, that's, that, that sounds wonderful. Let's, let's do it and send it to PowerPoint when you can. And that's it. That's as far as you go. Now, most people are not aware or maybe they're not accustomed to being able to, well, to, to be demanded upon a lot more. So we demand a lot. We, we, we actually, when we invite someone, we don't actually send us out an outright invitation. What we say, we'd like to explore the possibility. So it's not an outright invitation like a blank check where the speaker will be able to say anything and will say, yes, sir, yes, sir, or yes, madam. That doesn't work like that. So it's, again, content first, idea, the project, the message. Then we, if someone, by the way, if someone approaches us without a clear idea, we just want to listen. I'm sorry. We don't have time for that. It's, it's just wasting time. Myself or ourselves, not myself personally, but our, our, from everyone in our team and also from the speaker that he or himself or herself. That doesn't make any sense for us because for us, this, we, yes, we do care about the speakers. We, we cherish the speakers, but we always tell them, I'm sorry, but you're not the most important thing here. The most important thing is the idea that you try to convey. Because if someone else has the same idea, you, we can put somebody else. I'm sorry, we are all replaceable. 
myself included. We're all replaceable. So don't focus too much on yourself. If we focus too much on ourselves, we're not going to go anywhere. Unless, of course, there are exceptions. Like, I mean, if I'm Barack Obama, of course, everybody will, will want me. I'm, you know, I could be, the, you know, going to anywhere, talk about, you know, cabbages and, and carrots, and it's, that's fine. Everybody will listen. Like, but if, but if, you're you're not. Trump, <laughs> if you're Trump, not everybody wants of course, you. <laughs> exactly. Fame isn't everything. And, and that, that, but that's a really important insight. Now, another thing that happens to me is, and this is my experience, and by the way, this is a recent experience again, because a few years ago, this was uh, a little bit better. This year, for example, for the export, it was, it was a little bit harder to get uh, women who wanted to be speakers. So even uh, you know, regardless of having or not the theme, which of course here we just focus on the people who have themes, who have ideas and, and projects, it was harder. For example, in 2018, 2017, we had um, parity. You know, perfect parity. In fact, in 2017, we had eight speakers who were women and seven who were men. And they were all amazing. All the ideas, you know, on an equal basis. And, and we love that. That's, for us, that's, that's really what we, we want to attain. This year, it was like nine men. I think it's six women. I could be wrong, but it's, I think it's like that. And that's, I wouldn't say dispiriting because, you know, it's still, you know, on, on, you know, on that ribbon, let's say, on that, that track, that it's, it's considered to be okay. But it could be better. It could be better. So what we find is when we invite women, we're more likely, and I'm not saying this is a, a rule, but we're more likely to not get a response or to get an immediate response, say, yes, let's do this, but then we don't get the, the following up response there. When we ask for, you know, that the speaker needs to fill in an application or at least at the very least write half a page with what is the idea, what is the project, tell us. It's not just, you know, you. It's, again, it's about the idea. And they're not so willing to do that. Um, and why funnily do you enough, think is that, uh, Norberto? Because now I'm curious. Well, I, I don't know. And it's hard for me as a man to actually infer what could happen. I could, of course, I mean, it, it could be because they're hyper busy. It could be because most women are a bit more perfectionist. They're kind of afraid of seeing themselves on stage without having a perfect message, without being completely perfect in every sense. And men, we don't think about this. We just go and that's it. We're crazy. We know, we, we, sometimes we don't think. Men don't think. We just go and then think later. And women try to think and, and you know, think everything beforehand quite well. And at some point, and it, I guess this happens for men and women in the same way, they realize, wait, this Norberto and the people from the export are asking me for this amount of work and maybe I don't have enough time. Now men will say, yeah, yeah, well, let's do it anyway. And the women start falling behind. They said, mm, I'm not so sure. Or they don't respond. And that happens. Back but I, I, don't, I can't go any further than that. I don't know. I, I, you know, every case is a case. I would say from my experience, because you know I mostly work with women, and I, one of the things I say to them, I write in the whiteboard, perfection. I ask, who is perfection here? And most of I, I said, stop this now. Exactly. This perfection, you have to be, let's say, try to be prepared instead, yeah. Yeah. instead of in pre uh, perfectionist, because perfectionism for me is procrastination, because at the end, you never do it, because you're never ready, you're never ready enough to start doing something, yeah. to be prepared to do something, and then go with the flow, preparing, always preparing, because then the guys, sorry to say, you jump too much, too fast, in certain things and you're not prepared at all, but you have been playing the game longer and yeah. getting a, a, along with it without too many, uh, let's say, feedback to yes. say it very That's politely true. and diplomatically. <laughs> and, but I, I'd say- uh, Completely true, Tulia, completely yes, true. Yes, I would say now you have women like Tulia and many others that Tulia know, they'll be ready to give a feedback and to make you to think about it before jumping too fast in yeah. your decisions as well. So, but the thing uh, is, Tulia, you can't make men jump less fast, less quicker, but we have to make women jump faster, I think. Okay. Um, because I, I, it's I, I impossible to put men. I mean, it's difficult to get either way, but that point, the point is it's very hard to put brakes on, on a man like that. Yeah, yeah. Men will always, you know, when we find the gap ahead, we'll just go and fill it. It's normal. It's just there for the taking. It's like overtaking, overtaking a car. When you have an extra second, you know it, you overtake it and that's it. You don't think about it a second time. But it's difficult to stop that behavior. Really difficult. Okay. I mean, maybe you can start that in a new generation, but then it will take, over and take, take a long time before it takes over the whole society. But then it's perhaps easier to have a, 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 
a, a, a number of women who are leaders and perceived as leaders who start doing that and they will inspire other women to do that as well, right? Yes, it is a, it's a step by step. Yes. I believe it's a long process, but we, st we are already seeing positive results towards that. And I'm very oh, happy yeah. because I'm part of it. I'm part of uh, supporting that. It's, it's part of everything I do. And I use the communication as the tool to help uh, women to build up their confidence and to yeah. finally have the voice that they, they have inside. That we all have. We all have a message that matters and that needs to be shared about we, above all, like we need to know where we want to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, my last question for you, uh, we could be here talking forever, but um, you know about my challenge next week. So, mm -hmm. and this is why also uh, I'm doing this challenge to bring uh, these opportunities, these stage opportunities to professionals and is open to men and women. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, I'm pulling more women to, to the event and I have a very fair is very well balanced because I have seven and I have four ladies and three men. So that's good. That's very good. And uh, uh, what, with your all experience with big stages, with preparing speakers, and uh, what would be your, let's say, three tips for them, for them for get ready for I, next I can't count next past week. three, so I think I'll probably overshoot that. But I think the very most, the most important thing, of course, we've already said, which is connect to the public. For that, we need to know who they are. And even if you don't know personally each and every one of those people, you don't have to. But you know, you have to think of where they come from. What kind of context are they in? Are they coming from companies, from NGOs? Are they unemployed? I don't know. It could be anything. So you have to know exactly what kind of people we're talking to. What are their desires? What kind of think, things they appreciate and the things that they dislike? What kind of things that you might um, pique their interest with and what things are, you think they, they could be a, a, a killer, like, um, like a bad joke, for example. You could, so you have to be a, very keenly aware who are the people that you're going to talk to. Now, that's not a way, in any way enough. You have to prepare a lot. And I can't overemphasize how important prepare, preparation is. You have to prepare and then prepare again and again and again. And I would say, I'm suggesting, never in front of the mirror. You have to prepare in front of other people. If you have a, a good speech, if you have a good presentation, do it in front of your friends and your family. Ask for their feedback. Record it when, you know, record your own speech on your mobile phone and see it again. And re keep recording it over and over and over again until you have your own feedback and, see, and watch yourself and see, wait a moment, this is how I'm moving. This is how I'm, I'm making or not making visual contact with the public, for example. And if you start, you know, being very nitpicky, looking at all those things and try, trying to chip away all the bad behaviors that we all have. But you start taking them away. You, we don't have to add new things. We just have to add to take away all the bad habits. Then you start getting your message across. That's, you know, that's more than halfway through until, you know, to, for, the, for, for success. You'll get there, definitely. And there are a few things. I, I, just a couple of um, suggestions here. There is, I can't have emphasize enough also how important it is to have visual contact. I mean, I could be talking to you if I were looking not to this little button here in front of my computer, but if I were looking to the side and talking to you for, for an hour without looking at you, you feel this is really, really strange, right? I mean, this, it doesn't work. You know, it's like trying to talk to someone who's not looking at you. But look, you are in the, if you are in the public, put yourself in, in the public. And if you see someone who's not, it's not even, he or she is not even acknowledging your presence by not looking at you. So you have to do the same. When you go onto the, to the stage, you have to acknowledge at the very least everyone's presence by looking at them. And by doing this, you'll, you'll be doing miracles. You'll be making sure that they also look at you, first of all, because it's not as though they feel obliged, that they feel drawn into you. They, you'll get their attention, so we, they will know what your message is. When, they, when you ask them, so what did you think about my message? They, will, they won't have forgotten it. They will know what it is. So visual contact is extremely important. A couple of other things as well, your voice. Voice is your main tool to get your message across. So don't believe that those statistics saying, oh, only 7% is verbal communication. That's nonsense. It's not like that. It's actually a lot more than that. And let's not put even percentages here. But voice is extremely important. And again, voice, you don't have to be uh, you know, super, um, you know, like, like an amazing speech uh, speaker. 
but you have to sh chip away all the things that are, again, between you and your message in the public. For example, if you ha use crutches, verbal crutches, like those uhs, and those like words like just, and uh, starting word sentences with so, and but, and all those words that sometimes they, they don't mean a lot, and they're in the wrong place, and they carry too much voice energy, too much sound energy, but hardly any meaning. Just eliminate them ruthlessly, all of them, without exception. Of course, we, we can never get to zero, but you know, we can get close enough to zero so that people don't even think that are, we said any of those. So sometimes we could say a couple of, uh, you know, here and there in a presentation, but if you just say once or twice in five or 10 minutes, people won't even notice. But if you say 10 or 15, people will definitely start to notice. If you say more than that, and it's like you're in prison, people are in, in the public will be like doing one, two, three, four, scratch, one, two, three, four, scratch. It's like they're in prison, it's a stick per day. And it's a prison, you know, not using it. Your voice will cause, you know, it's like a prison for them. And they'll just be looking at their watches and say, yeah, how long is this going to last? Do you think it's going to last long? So it that, gets that's annoying. It is. It yeah. gets annoying because uh, uh, the important thing here is uh, uh, for the speaker always uh, is the connection, how we maintain this connection with the audience. So we have to work on all the other elements and the skills we, uh, we have available for us mm -hmm. to keep going this connection and switching from one thing to another. And you gave her, us here very good three ones that I hope my, my speakers and other speakers and professionals out there take note on them. Never underestim underestimate preparation, preparation, yes. preparation, and preparation, and more preparation. And more yet. <laughs> and more. And eye contact, so important. Yes, you have to glance over, make sure you include everyone from the audience through your eyes, through your expressions, and voice. And voice is something that sometimes, unfortunately, nature has not been so just to, oh, yeah. to women. Yes. And uh, sometimes the women, they, they do have a very high pitch and the way they speak, they might look very childish. And these are things that when I see that happening with the women I work with, I, I talk to them and I suggest them to go for uh, voice coaching to help them to improve. And one thing that you, uh, to finalize that you said about the, as we call the crutches or filler words, et cetera, that most professionals out there, they have no idea right. that they use those because they never got get feedback on their presentations. And this is another good thing about our challenge next week because all the speakers, each of them will receive on the spot feedback for each of the judges. We have four. Mm -hmm on what they have done well and what they can improve. That will be done orally. So everybody will learn from that. So this is a big bonus for them. And they would have to learn how to receive feedback as well. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's hard <laughs> sometimes. Because you that's feel hard like sometimes. we are on, on the spotlight. Like, oh, this person is telling me this, but I've always done it like this and I've been pretty success successful. No, maybe you are successful despite having that limitations. And uh, it, there's no there's no limit to the amount of value that you can get from good feedback and from actually the fact that you're open to, to feedback. If you do that, you'll, you'll be able to improve yourself and you'll have more invitations to speak in public if you want to. That's, Absolutely. That's and I'm looking forward to one day to be able to step on your stage there in Porto. Let's see. I <laughs> haven't been brave enough to send an application to you yet. <laughs> So I'm here but guilty. You're, you're as proactive child. because you know you know now what what we're looking for. So <laughs> okay, so I have time. I have time until the end of the year to to put the application together. Absolutely. So Norberto, it was a pleasure talking to you. I could talk to you here for forever. And if there's anything else you'd like to say, say it now. Well, the only thing I could say is. If we are, speak well in public, this is an extra place where we can express ourselves. And this is really important. We can't just express ourselves in uh, small niches like, uh, you know, between our bosses and our uh, co-workers, our husbands and wives and so on. We have the obligation in a big world like this 
to be able to put these ideas across to a very large number of people. And there's no better way, apart from YouTube, which is kind of unsure, you know, it could be, could be quite well or it could, you could bomb, but it's, there's hardly a better way now to do this than on a public stage. In front of, could be 100 people, could be 10,000 people, who knows. But if you are able to do this, you'll find an outlet for your ideas, for your expression. And there's hardly it's, it's something that I can find these days, apart from, you know, of course, love and care and attention, that we can give more importance than our own self-expression. And that's what sets us apart from everybody else. What I mean is, that's what makes us individuals. The ability to speak, the ability to say, to speak out our ideas, and to share our opinions on, on whatever it is, and to be able you know, to create a better world. If you do this, you're on the right way. And my suggestion here is don't shy away from the public, however, you know, from, from a stage. Don't shy away from that. You don't have to, you shouldn't. You owe it to yourself, you owe it to your relatives, to your family, to your friends, to the potential public to get your ideas across. And I'm sure that in the end, if you do it well, people will come back to you and they will say, at the very least, a huge thank you with a huge smile. And some of them might ask you for an autograph. That's awesome. Thank you so much. So it's a very good call to action for them to stand up, speak up, and take the challenge. Thank you.